Welcome students to lesson 16 of the natural hazards topic. In this lesson we will be continuing our study of Typhoon Haiyan, the devastating tropical storm that hit the Philippines in 2013. We will be focusing here on how the country and countries around the world responded to the tropical storm to return lives to normal. Please write the date, title and learning objective and have a pen and paper ready to learn. Time to review prior learning. Write 1 to 10, answer the questions from memory, and then mark your answers. Game time. Okay, number 1. Philippines. 2. Sapphire Simpson scale. 3. Between 6,100 and 6,300. We're not entirely sure. 4. 5. Between 15 and 5 degrees north and south of the equator. 6. 27 degrees, that's really important. 7. Decreases. Because there's no water to evaporate, which means clouds can't form, which means the pressure can't decrease, which means you can't have a tropical storm. 8. The Coriolis effect. 9. The track is the direction they travel in. 10. Low air pressure. Give yourselves a mark out of 12 because number 4 is worth 3 marks. If you got 10 or more, excellent, you really understand this. If not, go back to the previous two lessons, watch them again, and then attempt these questions in about a week's time. Okay, to introduce this lesson, I'm going to help you recap your memory of the effects of Typhoon Haiyan. So I'm going to show you some photos that you will remember if you've studied about the effects from the previous lesson. Look at the photos and then write as many effects as you can think of and any other information that you know about the photos. Take a couple of minutes to do this and then we'll discuss the answers. So you should have had a range of different effects listed. You may have sorted these into environmental, social and economic. You may have sorted them into short-term effects, long-term effects or primary and secondary effects. So, for example, you may have said deaths, you may have said destruction of schools, secondary effect, loss of education. You may have said devastation to agriculture, for example, these coconut trees, which leads to a loss of income. You may have said shipping and fishing boats were destroyed, which again meant a loss of income, but also a loss of food. You may have said the Taklaban airport was damaged and that this would have reduced the effectiveness of aid delivery. You may have said that communications were destroyed because of telephone lines being destroyed and also roads would have been blocked, again shown here. You may have talked about Taklaban Convention Center being damaged and flooded by the storm surge. And again, another picture of the storm surge here, a fishing trawler being brought onto land. You may have talked about the fact that the intense winds of Typhoon Haiyan would have, would have broken trees and other infrastructure in the towns near the coast in the Philippines. And you may have mentioned the storm surge here. Finally, you could have talked about displacement of about 600,000 people, where people are forced to leave their homes, sometimes for more than a year. All of these were significant effects of Typhoon Haiyan. Today, in this lesson, we're going to look at how the Philippines and other countries responded. Let's go. So write the subtitle and underline it with a ruler. As I explain the story of how people responded, you should be writing notes and highlighting the key ideas or key facts. So the first thing you need to know is that a response to a tropical storm and any natural hazard actually happens before the storm or the hazard even occurs. So how did the Philippines prepare before Haiyan hit? Well, the first thing they did was create, was create these. This is a map of the Philippines and as you can see it's in different colours. And the different colours show the chance of areas of the Philippines being affected by tropical storms. This type of map is called a hazard map. And it's used by governments to predict which areas are most vulnerable or at risk from tropical storms. And as a result of that, it helps the governments prepare more effectively. So, for example, in the Philippines, they prioritised their construction of stronger buildings in the north because they knew that the risk of, ty of typhoons in the north was greater than the south. They 
set up more evacuation centres in the north and built stronger infrastructure. Additionally, as a result of this hazard map, the Philippines developed evacuation shelters like this across the country. These shelters are not designed to house people long term, but up to a few months. As you can see, they're cramped and likely very uncomfortable, but they're much better than being completely homeless. This one set up in an old sports hall. Such facilities are vital if a country like the Philippines is going to be able to cope after a tropical storm. And this photo taken a few days after Typhoon Haiyan passed over proved to be very important as thousands of people were displaced by the damage from the storm surge and the winds to the towns on the coast of the Philippines. For example, Tacloban here. Not only that, perhaps the most important preparation that the Philippines made was called the Purok system. Here it is. In the Philippines, which is a low income country, although it has recently become a newly emerging economy by the definition of its GDP per capita, because the average income in the Philippines per year for one person is $3,000. Many people cannot afford to rebuild their homes if they are destroyed. And consequently, they remain homeless for a long period of time. Not only that, Many people are unable to get loans from banks to rebuild their homes because banks won't loan to people that they think won't pay them back. Additionally, in countries like the Philippines, getting access to something called insurance is difficult. Insurance is when you pay monthly to a company called an insurance company. And if something is damaged, for example your home, then the insurance company will pay for the costs of repair. Again, that's expensive. Many people in the Philippines don't have the money for that. So they came up with this system called the Purok system. Here's how it works. The people in this village all put some of their money into a community bank called the Purok. And when there is a natural disaster such as Typhoon Haiyan, the Purok pays out money to those people who need it most to rebuild their homes. And so this is called community insurance, whereby they help each other through sharing their money to recover after a disaster like Typhoon Haiyan. And this proved incredibly important for the Philippines after the storm hit. The next type of response is immediate. What, is it, what did the Philippines do right after the storm hit? Well, the first thing is this. As with any natural disaster, or man-made disaster for that matter, the most important thing to do is search and rescue. In the case of the Philippines, this meant going to the coastal towns, in particular, as you see here, towns like Tacloban, where the storm surge of up to 5.2 meters and the wind speeds of up to 195 miles an hour devastated the town, tore down trees and houses and brought salt water onto the land, trapping people in buildings or in cars or underneath debris like this. And so search and rescue is so important to be able to ensure that you save as many lives as possible in the few days after the natural disaster. Because once a few days are up, if people haven't been found, then the chances are they're dead. Now these search and rescue efforts were hampered, which means made more difficult by the fact that the roads were blocked by the debris. And so many search and rescue operations, as you see here, had to be on foot, which was much slower. Consequently, people were trapped or left without uh, emergency services rescuing them for longer periods. And this increased the death toll. It also increased the stress for people, the illnesses and the long term effects of injuries because the search and rescue was slower. So that's one limitation of the search and rescue efforts in the Philippines is that they were delayed by the blocked roads. Philippines, being a relatively low income country, lacking resources and equipment to be able to rescue people and provide emergency supplies such as food, shelter and medicine to everyone in the country, needed help. Governments from around the world provided resources to the Philippines to be able to help the people to survive. This picture here shows a helicopter being provided by an HIC government 
This helicopter was so important in the Philippines because the Philippines is made up of more than 1,700 islands, islands that were cut off by Typhoon Haiyan, meaning that normal vehicles such as ambulances and boats that were destroyed by the storm surge were unable to rescue people or provide aid. And so these helicopters provided a vital source of aid and relief to people on cut-off islands, as you can see here, where they're providing food. Not only that, HIC governments from around the world, such as this from the United Nations, which is a group of all the countries in the world that helps to solve the world's problems, such as death after a tropical storm, sent military planes filled with food and supplies. This is an Amer a picture of an American series of planes in Tacloban. These governments, these HIC governments, helped to fill in the gaps where the Philippines government was unable to supply relief to people. Another example, the British ship HMS Invincible provided more than a thousand tons of rice and other food to the people in the Philippines. And the American aircraft carrier called the USS George Washington, an enormous military ship, provided many hundreds of doctors and volunteer soldiers and medical supplies to the Philippines to be able to solve its immediate problems, which were above all a lack of medicine, a lack of food, and a lack of shelter. However, it wasn't just governments that helped. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, were also very important. A non-governmental organization is trying to help solve a problem that doesn't want money. Not only that, it doesn't work for any government. They're much smaller and they're run by ordinary people. One of the most famous NGOs in the world that helped after Typhoon Haiyan was the Red Cross, which works in many countries. This NGO provided training to the local people in how to, for example, remain hygienic, so how to wash hands and how to prevent the spread of diseases. This NGO was extremely effective after Typhoon Haiyan and it is considered to be one of the main reasons why almost no diseases spread, for example, through contaminated water after Typhoon Haiyan. Not only that, the shortage of doctors in the Philippines was filled in by the doctors provided by the Red Cross, which helped the local people deal with immediate injuries and illnesses caused by, for example, a lack of food and being injured by flying debris, for example, in the streets. However, two main challenges faced the immediate responses to Typhoon Haiyan. The first, the roads were blocked by the debris, as you saw earlier. The second, because all security was lost in many of the towns, police unable to be effective, and because people lacked supplies of food and water, looting broke out and violence broke out in some of the towns as people tried to steal from shops. And this meant that aid, such as this government aid called USAID, couldn't be provided to people immediately. In fact, within the first week, only one-fifth of US aid was actually spread around Tacloban for those two reasons. And this is a significant limitation to the responses caused by violence and by blocked roads. So weeks pass after Typhoon Haiyan. And after weeks go by, immediate responses are no longer as important because you've saved as many people as you can. Now comes the time to help people recover and return their lives to normal. And most importantly, to reduce the chance of a similar sized disaster in the future. So how do they do that? These are called long-term responses. The first is this. It was understood by the Philippines government and NGOs that sanitation would be crucial, which means very important, in ensuring the long-term health of the people in the Philippines. Clean water and toilets and sewers ensure that people don't get common diseases such as cholera from drinking contaminated water. This meant that children were able to return to school and have high attendance at school because they weren't getting ill. It also meant that manufacturing, the secondary sector, was able to return to 
work because clean water is required to, for example, cool machines in factories. And consequently, because sanitation helped improve people's health in the Philippines rapidly, their lives were able to return to normal much more quickly. And those people, because they were healthier, were able to get back to work, increasing incomes and allowing them to recover more quickly. Another long-term response which happens after is reconstruction. This is an example of hazard mitigation because it reduces the chance of future hazards causing the same damage. This building here and this one here have been built back better. It means making buildings stronger than they were before and designed better than they were before so that if a similar sized tropical storm hits the Philippines, it doesn't cause as much damage. This is an expensive process and it was partly funded by countries from around the world which gave money to the Philippines to ensure that Build Back Better could happen. Additionally, this process takes a long time. Constructing strong buildings is not an immediate process and not all the money was available to all of the people after Typhoon Haiyan. And so people, for example, those in rural areas or the particularly poor people in the Philippines often couldn't wait for their houses to be built stronger and so many resorted to building weak houses again. However, we know that about three quarters of homes in the cities in the Philippines were built using Build Back Better, reducing the chance of future disasters. Another important long-term response was this. The tropical storm Typhoon Haiyan devastated the coconut farms in the Philippines, which are so important for their local incomes. About 10,000 10, trees were destroyed. Salinization, which is when salt water enters farmland, killing crops, meant that these trees would not be able to regrow for a long time, more than a year. Not only that, the fishing boats having been destroyed meant that fishing was not an option in the immediate aftermath, so the first few weeks after the tropical storm hit. As a result, rice farming was adopted. Rice can tolerate, which means put up with much saltier land, and it grows much faster. Because rice farming was adopted by the Philippines farmers, people were able to receive an income and gain lots more food much quicker, reducing the problem of hunger and of unemployment for many farmers in the country. Remember, the primary sector in the Philippines is an important one. And finally, the Philippines did something else that's very important, another example of mitigation. Many of the homes were built further away from the coast, as you see here, after Typhoon Haiyan, on higher ground and with stronger metal infrastructure such as these electricity and telephone lines. This is called land use zoning. It means you do not build houses in risky areas. And land use zoning is really important because the storm surges from typhoons such as Typhoon Haiyan are what caused so much of the damage to people's homes. And so land use zoning proved to be an effective way of reducing future hazard risk. As you can see, Typhoon Haiyan led to significant responses both from the Philippines but also from other countries around the world. The Philippines needed help from other countries because it lacked the resources and the equipment to be able to recover fast enough to save all the lives that were affected by the storm. There were many ways in which the responses were effective, but there were other problems that limited the effectiveness of those responses. Make sure that you are aware of both the, both the ways the responses were effective and important and the ways they helped and the challenges they faced. Okay, let's do some review questions. Say the answers out loud and then we'll discuss the answers. So question one. Why are hazard maps useful for countries like the Philippines? You should have said that hazard maps allow governments like the Philippines to prioritize, which means choose the best places where to place, for example, their strongest buildings, their most uh, recovery centers and emergency services. And, and install their best infrastructure. All of these are expensive, and so governments shouldn't waste money on areas that are at the lowest risk. Hazard maps help with this. 
two. Suggest two ways that HIC governments saved lives after Typhoon Haiyan. Well, you should have said that the emergency relief in the form of food and water and shelter provided by, for example, the US government on their ship and the UK government helped to reduce hunger and thirst in the immediate aftermath Math of the uh, typhoon and additionally the transport equipment such as the helicopters provided by those governments ensured that people in cut off islands were still given access to relief or were rescued and taken to for example hospitals on the main islands question three explain one reason why long-term responses that focus on mitigation are important You should have said that mitigation reduces the risk of future hazards causing the same effects, the same amount of death, the same economic impacts, so damage. For instance, build back better means that people are not only less likely to die from a tropical storm, but also the buildings and the businesses within them are less likely to be destroyed, meaning that the economic impact will be less. People lose less money, and so it costs less as well to repair. Okay. Time to practice. Read the questions, answer them using your understanding from this lesson, and then mark your answers. Make sure that you mark your answers in green pen and add corrections or any parts that you've missed. Go. So number one. Two. Any two of these needed. Three. And finally, four. Again, any two of these. Add any corrections that you need to. Make sure that you add any parts that you missed. I would strongly encourage you to add any and all of these if you didn't use them. Give yourselves a mark out of the total. If you lost two marks or fewer, you've really understood this and explained it well. Come back to these questions in a week's time, just these questions, and then attempt them from memory this time and see how well you do then. From this lesson and from memory, write two questions about anything you've learned and then answer them. Again, in a week's time, test yourself on these questions to see if you remember them. Thank you so much for joining me this lesson. I hope you've understood how people respond to tropical storms in low-income countries like the Philippines. Next lesson, we're going to be looking at some of the most effective strategies to preventing tropical storms from damaging people's lives. Join me then.